Faraday's Law and Lenz's Law are going to be the topic of this lesson in my new general physics playlist, which when complete will cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now in this lesson we're going to define magnetic flux. We're going to find out that when you have a changing magnetic flux, you can induce an EMF and a current in a loop of wire. So Faraday's Law is going to allow us to calculate the magnitude of that induced EMF, uh, and then Lenz's Law the direction of the induced current in the loop. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. Now, before we define magnetic flux, we're just going to do a quick review of electric flux here from a few chapters ago. And so electric flux was related to the number of electric field lines passing through a surface. And it could be a real surface or it could be some imaginary surface where we like applied Gauss's law and things of a sort. So either way. So, but in this case, the more field lines that pass through a surface, the greater the electric flux. Well, how do you get more field lines to pass through a surface? Well, you've got three ways. You can have a stronger electric field. That's the first way. You can have a bigger surface area for your surface. There's just a larger surface. Because it's larger, by, you know, by just the nature of its size, more electric field lines are going to pass through it, and so the area is related. But also how it's oriented with respect to the electric field. So it turns out if your surface and the electric field are in the same plane, well then no field lines are going to pass through it. So, but you're going to get a maximum of field lines passing through it when they're perfectly perpendicular to one another. And so if the electric field's in one plane and the surface is perfectly perpendicular to it, that's when it reaches its maximum for this electric flux. So theta here is defined in a very specific way. It is not the angle between the surface and the electric field. It is the angle between the normal to the surface and the electric field. And so in this case, if this really is lined up in such a way that this plane, the surface here, is perpendicular to the electric field, that would mean the electric field is exactly 90 degrees from the surface, which means it's zero degrees from the normal to the surface. That's theta. And when you have the cosine of zero, so the cosine of zero is one, and this electric flux reaches its maximum. Well, it turns out that magnetic flux works exactly the same way, but instead of looking at a surface in an electric field, we're now going to look at a surface in a magnetic field instead. And so now we'll be calculating the magnetic flux. So, but it's still related to the number of now magnetic field lines that are passing through the surface, and so that's going to rely not on the strength of the electric field, but the strength of the magnetic field. Still on the area of the surface, and theta is defined in exactly the same way. It is how far now the magnetic field is away from being perpendicular to your surface, away from the normal of the surface. If they're perpendicular, then theta is zero and cosine theta is one, and we've reached our maximum for magnetic flux. So once again, if your surface and the magnetic field are in the same plane, then no field lines pass through it, and theta would be 90 degrees, and cosine of 90 is zero, and the magnetic flux is zero in that case. Okay, so that is magnetic flux, and we have to define this because Faraday's law allows us to calculate uh, an, what the magnitude of an induced EMF is in a loop of wire when it experiences a change in magnetic flux. Now it has to have a change in magnetic flux. And to get a change in magnetic flux, you've gotta have a change in one of three things. Either the strength of the magnetic field is changing, the area of the loop is changing, or the angle, so how far away we are from the normal, if you will, has to be changing. One of those three things has to fundamentally be changing to have a changing magnetic flux. But if it does, then you can induce an EMF in a loop of wire. And that loop of wire, having this induced EMF, doesn't have to be hooked up to a power source at all. It doesn't have to have a battery as part of it or anything of the sort. But you can still induce an EMF and a current in that loop with this changing magnetic flux. And that's what Faraday's law describes. It describes the magnitude of that induced EMF relative to a changing magnetic flux over time. Now, if you have a single loop of wire, that's what N is. It's the number of loops of wire. A single loop of wire, this is just one. So in the EMF would simply equal just the change in the magnetic flux over the change in time. Now, there's a negative sign here, but we'll find out with Lenz's law that this negative is really all about direction, not about the magnitude. The magnitude here is just gonna be the change in magnetic flux over change in time for one loop of wire. If it was 100 loops of wire, well, then you just have to simply multiply by 100, and that's where n comes into play.
All right, so a little quick review here. So say we've got a loop of wire, and let's say we've got a current in this wire. going around like so, and just a quick reminder that we developed a right hand rule that says if you loop your fingers in the direction of that current, then where the magnetic field generated coming out the center of that loop, or in, you know, at the center of the loop, will be your thumb. And so in this case, this is going to generate a magnetic field right coming out of the board at the center of this loop. And we want to keep that in mind. That's going to help us kind of uh, analyze Lenz's law just a little bit. Now, there's one other thing we got to talk about, and that's the relationship between like velocity and acceleration, which you might be like, well, where's that coming into play here? It'll become evident in a second here for just a So let's say I take and throw this marker up in the air, and I throw it up in the air. Whoa. I was supposed to catch that. I kind of missed it. But as it was traveling upward, which way did its velocity point? Well, it pointed up. My question for you, was it speeding up or was it slowing down? Well, on the way up, it was slowing down. And so the key here is that the velocity pointed up, but the acceleration pointed down. So, and when your acceleration and your velocity point in opposite directions, that's the evidence that something is slowing down. And if you recall that acceleration is equal to the change in velocity over the change in time, that's acceleration. And I don't really care about acceleration. What I really want to you know, relate though in this case is the relationship between velocity and the change in velocity. So if your velocity and your change in velocity point in opposite directions, that object's slowing down. But if your velocity and your change in velocity point in the same direction, that's an object that's speeding up. And again, when this marker was on the way up, it was slowing down. But when it reversed direction, it was coming back down. Its velocity now pointed down and it was speeding up, which means its change in velocity also pointed down. So velocity pointed down, and now instead of acceleration, I really wanna highlight change in velocity also pointed down. And again, in this case, you might be like, well, yeah, the acceleration pointed down because gravity always points down, Chad. Well, rightfully so. But the key is really just the relationship between velocity and change in velocity. When they point in the same direction, something is speeding up. When velocity and change of velocity point in opposite directions, something is slowing down. So just keep that in mind here when we kind of look at Lenz's law for just a second. All right, so say we've got this lovely loop right here, this lovely loop, and let's actually redraw it. Let's get this all out of here and start from a fresh board. So let's say we've got a loop now, and now this loop does not have a current in it, there's no battery hooked up to it, or anything of the sort, but there is a magnetic field there. And this is a constant magnetic field. So, and this loop is just sitting there in this constant magnetic field. And my first question for you is, is there any reason to believe there should be an induced EMF here? Well, in this case, we need the magnetic flux to be changing. Well, if it's a constant magnetic uh, field and the loop is not changing its size in any way, shape, or form, it's not rotating so that the angle changes in any way, shape, or form, well, then we shouldn't expect there to be any change in magnetic flux. And if there's no change in magnetic flux, there's no induced EMF whatsoever. But let's say for a second now that instead, this lovely magnetic field is either increasing in strength or decreasing in strength. And we'll consider both for just a sec. So let's say it's increasing in strength, increasing in magnitude of the magnetic field. Well, if, the mag if this B value is getting larger, then the magnetic flux is getting larger. And if the magnetic flux is getting larger, then we have a change in the magnetic flux over time. All right, so the question though, is if this magnetic field is increasing over time, then what's gonna be the direction of the induced current in this loop of wire, which is kind of how we look at the direction of the induced EMF as well. Well, that's what the negative sign in, in Faraday's law deals with, and that's ultimately what Lenz's law puts into words. And ultimately what's it, what it says is this, is that the magnetic flux that results from the current in your loop will oppose the change in the magnetic flux that you have as well. So let's take a look at this for a second. So first I want to take a look and say, well, what is the direction of just the plain old magnetic flux? And it turns out the magnetic flux, the direction of it is just going to be the same direction as the magnetic field. And in this case, it's going into the board. 
And so it's into the board. Now the question though is what is the direction of the change in magnetic flux? Well, in this case, we said the magnetic flux is going into the board and it's increasing. So just like when you have a velocity in a certain direction and it's increasing, i.e. you're speeding up, that means the change in velocity pointed in the same direction. Same thing's gonna be true here. If the magnetic flux points into the board and it's increasing, that means the change in the magnetic flux also points into the board symbolized by that X here in this case. That's what I needed to know. It's not super important, it turns out in this case, that the magnetic flux points into the board. What I need to know is which direction does the change in the magnetic flux point. And the reason that's so important is because the induced current in this loop is gonna cause its own so kind of magnetic flux, an induced magnetic flux, and it has to be in the opposite direction of this, which means in this case, it needs to be coming out of the board instead. And so the loop of wire here is either gonna have a current going around this way or going around this way. If it's going around this way, it's gonna induce a magnetic field coming out of the board. If it's going around this way, it's gonna induce a magnetic field going into the board. What I need is for it to induce a magnetic flux out of the board. And to induce a magnetic flux out of the board, so then I need it to have a magnetic field coming out of the board as well, which will happen when the current, in this case, is going around counterclockwise from our perspective. And so going around this way, the right hand rule, it shows my thumb coming right out of the board, opposite in direction to my change in magnetic flux. Now a lot of students get confused with this and they, they struggle to see the difference between your magnetic flux's direction and your change in magnetic flux's direction. So, but it's really important. And again, if your magnetic field is increasing in strength, so, or if your magnetic flux is increasing, well then your magnetic flux and your change in your magnetic flux point in the same direction. But if it's decreasing, that's just like when your velocity is slowing down. If your velocity is slowing down, that means your change in velocity opposes your velocity. It's in the opposite direction as your velocity. And so the other option we said we would take a look at here, well, let's go back, and we're gonna leave the magnetic field pointing into the board. But now we're gonna say that the magnetic field is actually decreasing in strength. And so with your magnetic field decreasing in strength, well one, the magnetic field still points into the board, that's clear. And if the magnetic field points into the board, that means the magnetic flux points into the board. But if that magnetic flux is now decreasing because the magnetic field is decreasing, then that means that the change does not point in the same direction as the magnetic flux. It points in the opposite direction coming out of the board instead. All right, which means then that the induced magnetic flux due to the current in the wire is gonna to have to point back into the board. It doesn't oppose the magnetic flux itself, it imposes the change in the magnetic flux. And again, this is the real tricky part that some students uh, struggle with with Lenz's Law. All right, so in this case then, I need the magnetic flux, so let's get a B on there. So due to the induced current to point into the boards. My thumb needs to go into the board and that means I'm gonna loop my fingers around now in a clockwise fashion instead. So fingers around the current, thumb is the direction of the magnetic field and therefore the induced magnetic flux as well. And it's in the opposite direction as the change in the magnetic flux, that's Lenz's law. Let's look at some applications of this. So the first example we're gonna take a look at comes with a diagram looking a lot like this. It's actually prettier on the study guide here. So, but it says, the north pole of a magnet is moved toward a metal loop at constant velocity. What is the direction of the induced current in the wire as perceived from the right? And this is supposed to show that this loop is in the plane perpendicular to the magnet as the magnet moves towards it. All right, so we've got a couple questions to ask ourselves here. and so. Uh, one of them is the direction of the magnetic flux. We're gonna ask ourselves if there's any change in the magnetic flux. And then we wanna talk about the current induced in the loop to induce a magnetic flux and what direction that might be in. So those are our three questions we're gonna answer. And so keep in mind again that we're gonna have this bar magnet moving to the left here. We're gonna have a loop that's in the perpendicular plane, if you will, with the magnet moving towards it. So first thing we wanna ask ourselves is what is the direction of the magnetic field and therefore magnetic flux at the loop due to this magnet? 
Well, if we look at our field lines here, our field lines kind of going around like so. So for our magnetic field lines. And so in this case, at the loop, the magnetic field points to the left. And therefore the magnetic flux also points to the left. Now the question becomes is as you move this bar magnet to the left, that's gonna change either B or A or cosine theta if there's gonna be a change in the magnetic flux. Well, the area of the loop is not changing and it's remaining in the perpendicular plane to this magnetic field in which the bar magnet's moving towards it the whole time, so theta is not changing, but the strength of the magnetic field is what's gonna change. As the bar magnet moves closer to the loop, that strength of the magnetic field is gonna go up. And so B is changing here and it's increasing. And that's the key is it's increasing. And so just like when you have a velocity and that that velocity is going up, that means that the change in velocity points in the same direction as the velocity. Same thing here. Not only does the magnetic flux point to the left, but because it's increasing as the magnet gets closer and closer and closer to the loop, then the change in the magnetic flux also points to the left, which means that the induced magnetic flux as a result of the current in the wire, that's gonna need to point the opposite direction according to Lenz's law. It's going to need to point, and the word right doesn't start with a B. It's gonna to need to point to the right in this case. So if we look, that means my thumb is gonna to need to end up pointing to the right. And so that means that my current going around this loop, so the part that's further back is gonna be going up and then the part that's closer to us is gonna be coming down so that my thumb points to the right instead. So if we look at how we define this, typically we're gonna define this from the side where the magnet's on. So in looking at how that's coming around, from this perspective, if you see what I'm doing here, that's gonna be counterclockwise from the side of the magnet, looking at it from the side of the magnet. If you look at it from the other side, it would be clockwise, but from this side, it is counterclockwise. All right, so that's question number one, not so bad. Question number two, we're gonna use the same diagram just redefine some things here. So in this case, instead of a velocity that is moving the bar magnet toward the loop, we're now gonna have a velocity that is moving the bar magnet away from the loop. Well, if you notice, our field lines haven't changed their direction. Those magnetic field lines still point to the left. That hasn't changed. Let's get that up there. So magnetic field lines and then the very, where the magnetic field points left. But now we gotta talk about the change in the magnetic flux. And in this case, the question is, is the magnetic flux increasing or decreasing? If it's increasing, then it's gonna point left just like the magnetic flux itself. But if it's decreasing, then it's gonna point to the right instead. In this case, as the magnet gets further and further and further from the loop, well then the magnetic field strength at the position of the loop is gonna go down, it's decreasing. And if it's decreasing, then the change in the magnetic flux actually points to the right, the direction opposite of the magnetic flux itself. Which means then according to Lenz's law, so the induced magnetic flux due to the induced current needs to oppose the change, not the magnetic flux itself, but the change in the magnetic flux. And if that change in the magnetic flux points right, then my induced magnetic flux is going to need to point to the left. And so once again, we've got our loop here off to the side, and now I don't need my thumb to point right, I need my thumb to point left instead. And if we look at what this ultimately means, to make that happen, I need a, now a clockwise current from this perspective in that loop, and that's the answer. It's gonna be clockwise from the perspective as viewed from the side that has the magnet on it. So our third example is gonna switch things up just a little bit. So we're gonna change the orientation of the magnet, but still have it moving away from the loop. And the question says, the south pole of a magnet is moved away from a metal loop at constant velocity. What is the direction of the induced current in the wire as perceived from the right? All right, so let's draw those magnetic field lines on here again. Again, magnetic field lines outside the magnet come from the north and come back into the south end. So and we can see here that at where the loop is positioned, the magnetic field is gonna point to the right. And if the magnetic field points to the right, that means the magnetic flux points to the right as well. But the question is not where the magnetic flux point, but where does the change in the magnetic flux point? 
And as we move this magnet further and further away from the loop, the magnetic field strength is still going to be decreasing. And that's the key. If your uh, magnetic flux is increasing, then your change points in the same direction as the magnetic flux itself. But if your magnetic flux is decreasing, and it is here with the magnetic field strength decreasing, so that's when your change in magnetic flux again points in the opposite direction to the magnetic flux itself. So if the magnetic flux points to the right, but it's decreasing, then the change points to the left, which means that our induced magnetic flux needs to oppose that change and point to the right. So getting our lovely loop again and turning it sideways here. So I need my thumb to point to the right. And again, that from the viewed from the right is going to be in the counterclockwise direction yet again. So hopefully you're getting the gist of this. And again, the key is, again, figuring out if your change in magnetic flux points in the same direction as the magnetic flux or the opposite. And it really just comes down as your magnetic flux increasing, then it's the same direction. If it's decreasing, then it points in the opposite direction. So in the next example we're gonna take a look at, so we're actually gonna have the loop rotating. So the first three examples of Lenz's law application we dealt with, there was a change in the magnetic flux because there was a change in the strength of the magnetic field. But in this example, there's actually gonna be a change in the angle theta resulting in the change in the magnetic flux. Uh, and we'll treat it the same way though and figure out what is the direction of the induced current. So in this case, we're gonna start out, actually just read this real quick. So a single loop is rotated with constant angular velocity a quarter turn as shown in the diagram, and there's a single point uh, on the loop as shown in red for reference. So here, uh, this loop is in the plane of the board, in the same plane as the magnetic field, and then it's gonna be rotated, so 90 degrees to where it's perpendicular to the magnetic field instead. All right, if there is a constant magnetic field directed to the right, and the plane of the loop is initially parallel to the field, then in what direction is the current in the loop during this time? Assume as, uh, or I'm sorry, assign as clockwise or counterclockwise relative to the diagram at t equals zero. So we're gonna design, you know, as this loop turns, so obviously this loop is gonna turn perpendicular here, but we're gonna define the current as either clockwise from this perspective or counterclockwise from this perspective at t equals zero. So that's kind of what the question's getting at. So in this case then, again, the magnetic field strength not changing. The area of the loop is not changing. So B and A are constant, it's the angle theta that's changing. And so initially, we are 90 degrees away from being normal to the plane of the loop. So, and again, when cosine is of 90 is zero, you get no magnetic flux to start with. So in fact, we can write that down. So the magnetic flux equals zero. Now over here, when theta is equal to zero, cosine of zero is one, and your magnetic flux is equal to b times a, this is when your magnetic flux reaches a maximum. And so that's why we got a changing magnetic flux. It's going from zero to this maximum value of b times a. And again, we don't have any math to do here. We just wanna know what's the direction of the induced current as a result of this changing magnetic flux. Well, in this case, we gotta ask ourselves the same question. What direction does the magnetic flux point? What direction does the change in magnetic flux point? And therefore, what is gonna be the direction of the induced magnetic flux as well? Well, in this case, what direction does the magnetic field point? The whole time it points to the right. And if the magnetic field points to the right, the magnetic flux points to the right. And in this case, is that magnetic flux increasing or decreasing? Well, in this case, it's going from zero up to its maximum value, that's an increase. And again, as long as the magnetic flux is increasing, then the change in magnetic flux points in the same direction as the magnetic flux itself, which in this case is also to the right. And so Lenz's law predicts that our induced, uh, the, the magnetic flux associated with our induced current is gonna have to point opposite to that change and therefore in this case point to the left. And so again, if we pull our loop up, so perpendicular 90 degrees here. So if I want my thumb to point left, so then I can see here, if I match this back up here, I'm curling around in the clockwise direction relative to this first one. And our current here is clockwise relative to this diagram right here. And again, it's a little harder to see on this one, but same kind of thing. 
as well. But it is clockwise relative to this diagram, which is kind of the hint the question gave. These are some of the more common lenses law applications you're going to see. I'm going to do another example here that's now going to deal with an application of Faraday's law and a calculation to go with it, but also still an application of lenses law. So the special application of Faraday's law we're now going to look at is what we call motional EMF. So before we talk about it, we just want to talk about kind of the foundation of it, and that's taking and moving a conducting rod in a magnetic field. And what we're going to do here is we're going to take this lovely conducting rod and move it to the right. So, and if you recall this lovely equation right here, so F equals Q V V sine theta. So we've got a conducting rod. It's got electrons that are free to move, although we like to usually think of it with conventional current. And I do want to talk about this in the context of current, as you'll see. So, but with conventional current, we talk about the imaginary flow of positive charges. And I'm going to kind of look at it more from that perspective. But as I move this bar to the right, these charges are moving that direction as well. And if we point our fingers in the direction of the magnetic field and our thumb in the direction of that velocity, we have a force coming out our palm on those positive charges. And so you're going to get the buildup of positive charge right there. Well, as those positive charges migrate, again, what's really happening in this conducting rod, as we do our right hand rule, it's not that positive, these imaginary positive charges are actually migrating to the top of the rod. It's really that electrons are coming, being negative charge, coming out the back of our hand and migrating down to the bottom. That's what's really happening. But the result is the same either way. You're getting a buildup of positive charge at one end of the rod and a buildup of negative charge at the opposite end. And you end up with an EMF across this lovely bar. All right. Now, in this case, we don't actually have a current because we're, this is not connected to you know, any kind of loop of wire or anything like that. But that's the next step. We're actually going to connect it to a lovely loop of wire. And so in this case, we're still going to have this conducting rod. So on a rail system, and it's going to slide along this loop of conducting wire. And so we have an actual complete circuit. And so in this case, as that happens again, we're going to get the positive charges wanting to migrate to the top, if you will. So, but in this case, they don't just pool up at the top. They actually can flow all the way around the loop. In, in a current in this fashion. And we can see that, oh, if the positive charges wanted to flow this way, if you will, well, flowing up through the bar, then they can go around the loop and we can predict the direction of the current. But we can also predict the direction of the current using Lenz's law in conjunction with Faraday's law in such a situation as well. And so if we take a look here, in this case, if I start moving this lovely bar to the right, so let's take a look at our magnetic flux our change in our magnetic flux, and then our magnetic flux associated with any sort of induced current in this case. Well, in this case, our magnetic field lines all point into the board, and therefore our magnetic flux also points into the board as well. Now, in this case, magnetic flux, is it changing? Well, the magnetic field strength's not. It looks pretty constant on the board and stuff like that. What's changing, though, is the loop's getting bigger and bigger and bigger as we move to the right. And if the loop's getting bigger, its area is getting bigger, then the magnetic flux is increasing. Had we been moving this bar to the left instead, well, then the magnetic flux would have been decreasing instead. But in this example, that loop's area is getting bigger. If it's increasing, then the change in the magnetic flux points in the same direction as the magnetic flux itself and points into the board in this case, which means that the induced magnetic flux, if you will, is going to have to be coming out of the board instead. Well, again, we already knew that we had a current flowing this direction through this loop. So we, we reasoned that out just by the, the charges and stuff like that, feeling a force as they migrate through this magnetic field. But in terms of Faraday's law now, we can see why they would have to be this direction as well. So because I need the induced magnetic field due to that current to point out of the board, and it does if the current moves in this counterclockwise direction. Okay, so a couple things to deal with in this case. So if we actually look at this induced EMF one more time, So there's our Faraday's law again. And in this case, again, that's going to be your change in B A cosine theta. 
all over your change in time. In this case, we're gonna do this for that single loop of wire. This is a single rail on a single loop of wire. So the N in this case is gonna be one. So that's why I kind of left it out here, whereas you see it here. So, but in this special application, it's just one loop. All right. So, and again, what's changing here, it's not B, it's actually A, and it's not theta either. In this case, this loop is perfectly perpendicular to the magnetic field the entire time. And so actually cosine of theta, in this case, theta being zero, since we're zero away from the normal, is one, and that goes away. And so, and then we can go the, even one step further. It's the change, and really I should have put this in parentheses, change in BA, but really that's B times the change in the area over the change in time. Okay, well, it turns out we're gonna define some things. So the length of this rail right here, we're gonna define as L in this case. So in this example up here, we're gonna find out that that L is gonna equal 1.0 meters here. So, and we've got a rectangular, or at least maybe a square, but some sort of rectangular loop in this case, that's gonna have a width here. And so that change in area, well, the length here is not changing, it's the width that's going to be changing. And so we can write this, again one more time as b and then the change in the area would actually be l times the change in the width over the change in time okay well as we move this lovely thing it's in this case it's moving in the x direction so in look, instead of looking at this change in width i'm actually going to look at it as the change in x and again it could you know if i were this different it could be moving up down left right whatever so but i want to make this look exactly like we need it to to define some things here so but if you notice we get the displacement delta x over delta t and what is displacement over time it is velocity and ultimately that's what this turns into is b times l times the velocity this is a special application of faraday's law in this case to uh, get a, a separate equation, but really is the same equation, looking a little different, in terms of uh, termed what we call motional EMF. So, and if you've got motional EMF due to this lovely rod, you know, conducting rod moving on a rail system of wire here, so you can use this equation. Now, we just derived it from Faraday's law. You can always use Faraday's law, but in this one special application, it might be easier to use this lovely equation instead. So, and that's the next problem we're gonna do here. It actually applies to this diagram here, and it says, what is the magnitude and direction, either clockwise or counterclockwise, of the induced EMF in the conducting wire in the diagram as the conducting rail slides along it to the right with a speed of 0 0.50 meters per second. Okay, this gets to be, as far as magnitude goes, pretty simple plug and chug. We know the strength of the magnetic field is 2.0 Tesla. We know the length of the rail is 1.0 meters. And we know the velocity is 0.50 meters per second. And if we use the formula here for motional EMF, it's a fairly straightforward plug and chug calculation. And so we're gonna get strength of magnetic fields, 2.0 Tesla. Length here is 1.0 meters. So, and the velocity is given as 0 0.50 meters per second. And so in this case, we're gonna get two times one times a half is just equal to one. In this case, 1.0 volts gonna be our answer. Now the direction here. Now this formula for motional EMF, you notice I lost that negative sign somewhere along the way. And again, that negative sign deals with direction. And for whatever reason with this motional EMF, we leave that off, it's just magnitude. The direction still comes down to Lenz's law. And in this case, with it moving to the right, we figured out the current would have to be around in this counterclockwise direction. That way the induced uh, magnetic flux pointed out of the board. Now a couple other things to look at here. So as you're pulling on this lovely rod to kind of pull it down this direction, there's an opposing force. And the harder you pull, the harder the opposing force gets as well, as we'll see. So if you recall now this equation, we had F equals I L b sine theta you might have had it as bil sine theta same diff so but in this case this was the uh, force on a current conducting wire in a magnetic field and it had its own right hand rule as well and for that right hand rule and i want to focus just on the current right here you put your thumb in the direction of that current you put your fingers into the board here in the, in the direction of the magnetic field and then coming out your palm was the direction of the force 
And as a result, as this thing slides this way, there's an actual magnetic force in the opposite direction. So you don't get a free lunch here. So as you're creating this induced EMF, you're actually giving the current, you know, the charged particles that make up the current in that, uh, you're giving them potential energy effectively. Where does that energy come from? Well, you're overcoming this lovely force right here. So you're having to pull. There's not like no force required to move this bar. So, and the harder you pull it, the greater the induced uh, current going around this loop and the greater this opposing force is going to become uh, as you go. So no free lunch here. You don't just, you didn't just create energy, but you can convert mechanical energy if you're actually using a force to pull this. So, and convert that into some form of electrical energy in this case. Now in the rest of the chapter, we're going to deal with things like generators and motors and back EMF and inductance and then RL circuits, which we've kind of laid the groundwork for here. If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.